Good morning, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I'm reliably informed that the um, pilot from that uh, short clip has just joined Etihad, so if any of you uh, jump on a 787 in the next couple of weeks, I'd suggest you buckle up nice and tight. Welcome to our discussion on aviation and in particular on aerospace financing. There's been a strategic alignment of national infrastructure, investment and national economic objectives within the UAE, and that's placed us at the heart of logistics in the West East Corridor. We've seen some absolute superlatives in the UAE that we can speak to. 101 million people passed through the airports of the UAE in 2014. We've got the largest international airport in the world. And that's in 10 years we've seen the growth from that original 101 million. That was 10 years ago, that was only 30 million. Last year, we had the privilege of having the chief executive of Strata sitting on this panel here as well. That was a greenfield startup now manufacturing parts for the most demanding OEMs in the world, Boeing and Airbus. There's such great development here that we have to applaud. We also have to look very closely at the amount of capital that we are going to require as we go forward into the next decade and to complete this decade as well. Just amongst the Gulf Three airlines, there is an order book of around $200 billion. Now the issue is, as the financial institutions here, the banks have done exceedingly well, and anywhere between 40 and 60% over the last couple of years of the regional aircraft have been financed by the banks, which is an you know, astronomical success. The issue being, though, we are going to have to create and innovate. You cannot just rely on the debt that we have pre pre preceedingly pr uh, provided to our very large airlines. The issue is going to be for us is expanding our knowledge base. We're going to have to take mature products from overseas, often from areas such as the more mature markets in the US, and develop those capital market products for our benefit, for our investors. And we'll have to put a different angle in some instances. For example, Islamic financing. Now today, we're very lucky to have with us Mark Allen, the president of Boeing International, who's going to give us a run through and his insights into a little bit of background of how Boeing works in the region, which I think is incredibly important to understand. Because as we talk about learning and partnership, we actually we have to have a partner of longevity, skill, and empirical ability to deliver solutions. We also have to look at the aerospace market because we have to attract new investors into the, into the region and from the region. And finally, we're going to have to look at the absolute landscape of where we are today in aircraft financing. So Mark, welcome. Thank you for being here. Give us a, a little bit of background about uh, Boeing International and your, your role today. Well, first, thank you for the kind invitation. It's great to be here. And uh, I've really enjoyed the discussion and the exchange over the last uh, day and a half. Um, Boeing. You know, the Boeing company is the world's largest aerospace company. Um, we connect and protect uh, millions of people every day all around the world. And Boeing International is charged with the responsibility to take this uh, now 99-year-old company and establish it as a global industrial champion, not just a U.S. company with international operations, but as a true global industrial champion. And we have, to do that, corporate regional headquarters in 16 different major markets. Uh, we have a couple that are more major. And of course, the UAE, the Gulf region, is one of those. So the charge here for Boeing International is very much about helping the enterprise as a whole to understand the opportunity, uh, showing the way towards the foundation of relationships we have, especially with the major airlines here in the UAE. 
Um, on top of that, building out our presence, and I can talk a bit about that in a minute. And then, critically important, putting together the partnerships yeah. that will help yeah. us and our Gulf partners together grow into global uh, operating elements, whether it's partnerships with the likes of Mubadala and Strata, with whom we've worked now for several years in close partnership, whether it's partnerships on the research and development, uh, such as we've done with Mazdar, whether it's uh, taking engineers uh, from Mubadala up to our engineering centers in Russia uh, to help bring them into the, uh, the, the, the family of aerospace engineering, uh, whether it's taking students and sending them to our operations in the U.S. to learn how we do, what we do, and then to bring them back into operations here in the Gulf. Uh, all of these are parts of the broad fabric of partnership that Boeing International is charged with building and managing. And there have been fairly extensive, I mean, we can see behind us some uh, a huge backlog. I think last year alone, into the region, around 50 or so Boeing deliveries. Uh, to, the, to the major airlines, a lot of, a lot of backlog. How, are you, how do you see the market developing in terms of you know, the, the whole aerospace sector? You know, we've heard a lot of um, concerns around the global macroeconomic issues. How do, how do you see the aerospace market panning out over the next sort of five years in terms of, of, of trends? We've got huge, I think this year alone, we've probably got about 125 billion dollars of aircraft financing requirements. We do, we do. So how does, how does that sort of play out for, for Boeing? Well, let me back up. There, there was something uh, that I heard yesterday that was, was really encouraging for me. It was when His Excellency, uh, the Minister of Culture, Youth, and Community Development, mentioned that 2015 has been declared the year of innovation. I mean, we're fundamentally about innovation, and I think you see it in that video when you see what the product itself can do. Yeah. It's innovation that drives efficiency. It's, in, it's efficiency that drives economies and GDP. That's what drives our business. So we have today uh, over a half trillion dollars of firmly contracted business that will deliver over the course of the next five to 10 years. It's half a trillion dollars, and it leaves open only two questions. Number one, how are we gonna become more competitive in our production? Yeah. So we are more profitable on that half trillion delivery. And number two, who's going to finance it? Yeah. A big question for this region. So when you think about who, what Boeing looks, uh, well, first of all, what the base of, of opportunity is, it's tremendous. Uh, aviation GDP continues to outstrip global GDP. We've been growing over the last four years now at about a 5% click. Uh, and so we're, we're moving smartly along, and that's in keeping with the historical performance of the industry. Uh, very consistently, aviation GDP outperforms overall GDP because of the way the two work together in such a, a virtuous cycle. Yeah. As aviation grows in a region, it supports further economic growth in that region. And of course, as the region becomes more uh, wealthy and prosperous, more people are free to travel want to travel. You mentioned 101 million visitors through the airports in the UAE this past year. You know, now compare that to this east to west corridor shift, west to east corridor shift, and you'll note that 100 million new passengers were minted this past year out of Asia. 100 million new passengers traveling multiple times each, of course, as they grow in their travel habits. So the demand is huge, and the Gulf remains positioned right in the middle of all yep. that opportunity. So, so yes, the world is a complicated place, uh, and His Excellency, Ex Excellency was very clear about that yesterday, talking about some of the chaos that's around. But the reality is that we are seeing dynamic growth engines yeah. in many parts of the world, all in interconnected fashion, and very many of them traveling through the Gulf as the central connector. Yeah. Look, it'd be wrong of us not to sort of concern ourselves a little bit with, you know, what, what does oil price mm. move? I mean, look, we've, we've got some of the, the aspects, and in fact, British Airways announced their results a couple of days ago um, and put in a very strong set of results, which partly they attributed to a rebalancing of the fleet. Much more fuel-efficient fleet. They're brought on new aircraft. They're users are now of the, of the 787. They're a user of, uh, of the A380. What, the what A3 what? what? The, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> it's a, a variant of the Jumbo, I believe. Um, but what's... What are the sort of the, the fundamentals? I mean, are people, are, they, are the tier one airlines going to change their buying programs and say, hey, we can, we can run our aircraft longer now? 
we aren't going to slow down. But on the other hand, we're making more money. That's so should we, act, should we accelerate our refleeting, our redesign of our, our, our fleet today? Yeah, I think this is a really important question. We haven't had that much discussion over the last day and a half here on oil. But I will say in our business, um, what we see from the recent price moves is that oil price has become an operating cost tailwind. It's moving businesses forward, like you mentioned, British Airways results. Um, that tailwind is going to lead to increasing growth. You know, I mentioned that it is a statistical matter, purely statistical matter, aviation GDP tracks and leads macro GDP on a global basis. Uh, when oil moves, if you look at it historically, uh, what you'll see is that oil's movement doesn't affect the aviation GDP line. It affects the allocation of new purchased airplanes, whether they go to growth, new routes, new frequencies, or whether they go to replacement, retiring airplanes, bringing in a new generation of technology, reducing fuel burn. Uh, right now, our expectation is, and the early data is consistent with, a story of growth. So we're continuing to see frequencies increase. We're continuing to see new routes opened up. Um, and the, the industry is shifting in a really positive way around that growth story. Okay. Now, how are we seeing, though, the the state of, and, and these, this is coming to the nub of, of, of the discussion today, is around the aircraft financing market. It's been hugely bullish, I have to say. I mean, we've seen, uh, just from a, a personal perspective and from our portfolio has grown significantly. We talked about it in the opening, that the banks have become much more comfortable with the collateral. I think that may have been partly driven by their comfort for the credit and not for the equipment. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I need to understand is, you know, Boeing, and you were the president of Boeing Capital as well, so you kind of get the, the, the macro view, but also the financing view. What do we need to do in terms of the aircraft financing market as, as a bank? What recommendations could you give us? And also as we go to investors, because you know, we keep hearing a lot about today even invest in real estate. You know, what are the other options for us? I mean, we're looking at aerospace. This is a mobile asset. It can be moved, you know, I can reconfigure an aircraft and I can then move it from, you know, one country to another. But what, what do the banks need to do to take us to the next level? We can do the commercial debt, but we need that step up. What, what, what would Boeing recommend? You know, it was probably only six years ago, back around 2008, 2009, when the regional financiers were likely contributing about 300 million or so to deliveries, airplane deliveries in the region. Uh, today, that number is uh, close to three to four billion a year. So just think about the growth inherent in that. Now, as a business, globally, we have been growing uh, quite well. We, we're up since that same time frame, 2008, we're up about 115% in our own revenues from about 28 million on the commercial side to the just close this year at 60. So, so you can see that the overall growth trend in the Gulf is you know, both with and leading the broader growth trend that we've experienced as a business. That creates opportunity. Um, all of us watching the video this morning of that incredible majestic 787 and flight over the fields of Farnborough, United Kingdom, you know, that ought to be enough of, a, of an impetus for us to step back and say, real estate? Why real estate? Um, we can invest in some of the most amazing product uh, that's out there. And airplanes are unique because they are globally mobile real estate. At the end of the day, their product values are such anywhere from 50 million to 250 million, depending on the, uh, yeah. the type. Um, they, they come in big blocks of cash need. They go into profitable deployment with airlines as soon as they're delivered. And any airline that has trouble with it uh, suddenly becomes the, uh, the, the, the first up candidate for a pull. Airplane pulled, redeployed by the lessor, by the owner to another jurisdiction. So the aircraft themselves are an incredible uh, parallel to real estate, but globally mobile. When the block is suffering, you don't have to stand with your lease on that, uh, on the, on that asset. Yeah. You can pull it to another jurisdiction. So we should, I mean, one of the things that I think we, we're trying to, and, and look, this is, this is an ongoing process of, of understanding markets. We have to sort of bifurcate between an airline and aircraft financing, they are not necessarily the same thing here. You're not, you're not taking purely sure. airline cre credit risk. You are saying, I have an asset. I will stake, I still have to underwrite that. 
But in terms of, of, of our understanding, Mark, as well, do we have to, we probably have to start also changing our banks, our financial institutions to become a little bit more aware of collateral values. I mean, today, you know, we know we talk to some investors, they will prefer yield over having a covered bond, for example, mm. uh, in terms of having the asset backing. That doesn't sound like a balanced philosophy to me. I mean, we were listening today to, to, to the sovereign wealth funds. It, it seems to be that we need to probably create a better platform of understanding of, of, of collateral. And that's where I think the partnership that we were discussing with someone such as Boeing, that education about understanding the longevity of the product cycle in financing is essential. It is. This, this is an important point to kind of hone in on because it's a, such a unique industry that you, you can't succeed in it without a great deal of product knowledge and without a great deal of aviation finance industry specialization. Uh, and so we spent a lot of time at Boeing working, of course, with NBAT, with others, uh, to partner in the region around round tables, um, open house sessions, risk discussions, to really tell this story. I mean, fundamentally, the great, great value and the reason why airplanes are such a great investment is the asset not the credit, right. but the asset strength of an airplane is unique. And of course, to really pull that strength out requires then understanding um, all the aspects of that, as that asset's deployment. So there are unique aspects in leasing, like the transition cost, right? Remarketing, how to manage that, residual value analysis that can deeply affect the value uh, that a financier takes out of uh, his yeah. or her position, uh, all of which are, you know, distinct, shall I say, in the airplane space. And so taking the time to develop that product knowledge is really key. Um, we're doing it with you under our, our prior agreements. We're doing it uh, throughout the region and we'll keep doing it more and more because that three billion I mentioned in annual funding need, it's eight billion when you, when you max it up for the whole industry, is only gonna grow over yeah. time. Here, here's a stunning fact, this is truly stunning. 30%, 30% of Boeing's wide body backlog orders reside with Gulf carriers, 30%. And you'll see those airplanes on, this, on the chart behind us right now, whether it's the 747-8 or the 777X, the new airplane to come, yep. or the 787, um, those airplanes have proven themselves to be uniquely useful in the market here. Understanding why is gonna be the first step to a financier's yep. getting comfortable taking a position in the asset as opposed to worrying about the airline credit. So actually, you're, you're suggesting that from a, from a perspective, we, we've got to move away from being a little bit less of just a pure bank and more as, a, a, as an asset manager as well. Now, is that one of the things that you've seen and the changes in financing today? Um, we're seeing lessors take an increasingly big part of the financing of, of new aircraft yes. deliveries. So back to your point on specialists, would you suggest then it's, it's probably in the... Uh, in our interest to, you know, there are, there are two areas here that I'm sort of alluding to. One, should we go down to work with lessors? Should you partner with lessors? Because you will then almost, I'm not saying you're outsourcing that risk, but those people have that necessary expertise before you can take and graduate to the next level. And then also, the other thing that we need to do as financial institutions is cycle our balance sheets a little bit more. We seem to be maybe a little bit too much on the take and hold, where you know, we, need to, we, we know that obviously the airlines here have, have some, some of them, and I think it's probably fairly well known, have five to six hundred million dollars of aircraft deliveries every month. So from your experience in the US, these assets are cycled much more effectively, and there's more partnership with lessors. I mean, would you recommend that the, the institutions here spend a little bit more time understanding those sectors? The, the last point's great because, it, look, it's the opportunity for tradable paper. Yeah. If you do the deal in the right way, you have truly tradable paper, which lets you cycle the balance sheet when it's in your interest to do the cycling. Yeah. But coming, coming back to the first question, um, you know, the opportunity around lessors is a real opportunity. When you think about even the development uh, here in Abu Dhabi at the Global Market Center we talked about yesterday, um, there are going to be, I think, a number of unique uh, points of development in the, uh, the, the legal framework, the yeah. policy framework of the region that can enable the continued growth of things like the leasing business, which will only be complementary to what you're doing in the banks. Um, 
you know, a fundamental to understand about aviation finance is it's one of the healthiest and most balanced of the financial markets. As you look across the sources of funding, um, right today we see lessor standing at about 40% of the funding. The capital markets deliver 30%, much of that through the lessors. On top of that are the commercial banks who stand around another quarter percent of the marketplace. Yeah. And then, of course, there's cash, equity, there's export credit agencies. There are a number of different streams of funding that give it a robust nature. So as a bank becoming involved uh, in, in uh, aviation finance, the leasing companies can be a great partnership. They can be a way to begin. Uh, and they can be a source of teaching and education. Yeah. At the end of the day, though, I do think that you will see in the environment here locally all of those different constituent parts playing a role. And the trick is, how do we come together? How yeah. do we build some partnerships, Boeing and the financial players and leaders in the region, yourselves, uh, the government regulators, to really uh, sit down, put, you know, sharpen our pencils, and work to build just the right frameworks for all of that to mature? Yeah. And look, I mean, I think, um, you know, National Bank of Abu Dhabi, certainly from the capital market side of things, we've grown our presence. We are... Uh, rated at probably the third largest issue of Sukuk paper. One of the things that we have to do, and I think that has to come from um, the OEMs as well, and, and some of the experts from the other markets, is that, you know, we have to create an Islamic solution as yes. well. I mean, that's, that's essential. I mean, we have a, a huge investor demand here for, for Islamic paper. But, you know, we could use some of the knowledge that you have gained the WTC market, for example, in the US, there's so much data available on aircraft financing and loss histories. And, and as, as my last recollection is that probably on the WTCs, the recovery rates under any of those Remarkable. instruments have been almost 100%. It's, it's more than 99% recovery through bankruptcy. And for, you know, look, we all know just how tough a time the US airlines had after, yeah. you know, after the last couple of decades of, it started in the 1970s, right, with the, uh, when originally they were very heavily regulated airlines, and they never quite got the business model, uh, and the airlines were in and out for decades. They finally have figured it out now, and that's a real uh, benefit for all of us to see the airline business get healthier and healthier yeah. because it just creates more and more financing opportunities. But through all of those, you know, swirling cycles of the 80s and 90s and 2000s, the bankruptcies that seem to come with regularity every four or five years yeah. never took down the holders of the WTC paper. That's really a remarkable track yeah. record to come in at over 99%, 99 cent recovery. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a terrific story to tell. And again, it all comes back down to the asset. Why did it work? It worked because as those airlines went through restructuring, the one thing they had to have to make it through restructuring <laughs> was the airplane. They had to have the airplane. They could fight with the unions, they could strip out pensions, but they had to have the airplane. And so the bankruptcy judges in US context always gave priority to the delivery of the lease payment. And beautiful solution. Yeah, and uh, look, I mean, I think it was one of the, the, the issues that came up today. Um, you know, we have to now attract, and, and we've seen recently in the market, just even in the, in the UAE, that external pension funds are now looking to invest because you have a kind of, I mean, it's, uh, you know, we, we, can, we can tranche, we can, you know, the, I think the airline industry or, or the aircraft financing industry has been incredibly innovative in defining different tranches. So it, it gives, some investors don't like to have amortization. They just want a bullet payment. Some guys like to have the, the, the amortizing side of the tranche. But from what I can see, we, c we can give quite a lot of attraction to people like the pension funds. Aircraft are typically financed anywhere from 12 years. We're seeing even 15 years coming into the market, which is- Very long-term play. Very long-term play. And some of these assets, I think, you know, with the, with, with the likes of the 777X and, and you know, the heavy metal, that is going to be a longer-term play. You're gonna sit with these assets for a longer period. The one thing I think we need to get across to people is that you know, this is not like your, uh, your car where you're getting a, a facelift every two years. You, know, you build these aircraft, they have a 25 to 30 year life cycle. This is a long tail business. Industry leases are 12 years. I mean, that's just the standard is 12 years. We'll see variability up and down, but there's a standard lease term of 12 years. It's a long term play. 
Uh, the tranching you mentioned is very important because it lets you play more conservatively around a 60% LTV at an A tranche or get more aggressive down to an 80, 85%, even sometimes 90% uh, on a C tranche. So there's, there's a real opportunity to put yourself in the right spot for your own investment profile. Uh, when you're in the aviation finance, uh, finance arena. Uh, the, the, the continued development of some of the capital market tools yeah. is another place of opportunity because it's not just the double ETCs. There are also the ABSs uh, that are being yeah. undertaken. There are, what are, there are private deals that are equivalent to private double ETCs yeah. that we're seeing happen. We're seeing PE come into the market, private equity. We're seeing insurance come into the market, yeah. right? We're seeing pension funds, as you mentioned, come into the market. So there's a growing uh, appreciation for the strength of the, uh, the aviation finance play. And to date, if you look, if you take the WETCs that are out there, and there are a number of great analysts that track them and report on them, what you'll see is that the WETC yields are still above their equivalent Rated. So if you look at, for example, the, you know, the, the, the IGs, yeah. investment grade uh, yields, WTCs with an identical rating trade at better yield. Great opportunity, and mainly because most people don't yet have the product knowledge they need to feel comfortable. Yeah. Uh, so they default to what are more standard classical environments like real estate. Uh, but when you have real estate that can move, yeah. so that when it loses productivity, it can go be productive somewhere, somewhere else, else in the world, Absolutely. anywhere else in the world, uh, it's an amazing story. Look, we, we, we're getting close on time, but one of the things I wanted to focus on, and you're very close as, as, as a, a president within, uh, within Boeing, to understand what, what's going to happen with the, uh, and it was brought up yesterday by uh, His Excellency uh, Hussein al nawais about uh, the XM ECA. Mm. I mean, we are investing a lot of time to develop our uh, market understanding. How do we use ECAs more effectively here, XIM? But the situation with Exim in the U.S., that seems to be a little bit uneasy. Um, I don't know. Can you share any light for us, perhaps, just to give sure. us context? Well, I was just in Washington, D.C. last week, and I did spend some time up on Capitol Hill meeting with a number of members of Congress to ask them what the status was and to have a discussion about the value of Exim for U.S. exporters, and I come to you with great news, which is in the House of Representatives, which is the most contentious body, and it, you know, we heard Secretary Powell yesterday describe it as a place that's getting nothing done, so it has its own challenges, <laughs> but having said that, uh, the, there are now 58 Republicans that have signed on to an XM reauthorization bill. That attaches to the full Democratic caucus which is signed on to a reauthorization bill, a different bill. Uh, together, their numbers mean that's a majority of the House of Representatives. That's a majority of Congress that supports the reauthorization of the XM Bank. Now, having a majority is the first step because U.S. politics is a tricky and slippery thing, uh, but it gives me great confidence yeah. that it will be reauthorized. It may take some time in terms of the political process, but the support is there. It will get done. Yeah. So look, in, uh, as, we, as we sort of wrap up and as, as people obviously want to get on to, to, to their break, I mean, Mark, what we've seen from my perspective is, you know, financial institutions growing in confidence. There's 125 billion every year for the next five years, we can see. In fact, it's going up to about 150 billion of aircraft financing requirements, new deliveries. What we're saying is we, we need to be smart in terms of our partnerships, it, working with the OEMs, working with lessors, sharing knowledge. I mean, I think that was one of the things that very, uh, came across, I think, very strongly yesterday. We have to, we have to share, yes. because this, this market is so big, there's enough for everyone. Um, I don't think that there's, uh, you know, anyone has to have some sort of special niche here. I mean, you have a lot to grow in. And, and as we've, we're looking at sort of the West East Corridor, we're going to need every kind of financing structure. I think the banks need to be, it was brought up yesterday, we've, we've just discussed it, Exim ECA, capital markets, we're going to have to develop covered bonds, we're going to have to keep that education. But from what I'm seeing, you know, we should have perhaps, uh, we need to get the business cards from our uh, sovereign wealth fund guests and, and, and start assuring them <laughs> we that we go, have another... We need to go find them at the break. <laughs> we need to find them at the break to say... <laughs> we, we have a solution for we you. We have a solution for some no, yield. I, I mentioned half a trillion dollars in committed, firm, contracted business that's going to need to be financed. Over the next 20 years, the outlook for the broad market is $5.2 trillion. Uh, right. and, and as I mentioned, we are so committed as an OEM to this hubbing strategy of building 
first a strong foundation of commercial work, then our presence through our own subsidiary operations here, and then through partnerships with all the key leaders. And that, that includes not just the industrial or the R&D, but it includes the financial. So our partnerships in region that let us focus on that education and that training to bring forward new opportunities in the marketplace yeah. for your bank, for other finance, financial players, everybody except for our comp competition. I don't need to mention them from the stage. Uh, we, we really want to create, ultimately, a full aviation ecosystem here yeah. that supports not just the Gulf, but rather is a global player stretching east and west. Yeah. Uh, I think we can do that. I think we're obviously off to a great start over the last several years, uh, but it's going to take continued yeah. effort and continued sharing, as you said. Wonderful. Well, I think Mark's available at, uh, hopefully, at the coffee time sure. to have. I think everyone wants to probably dash out now. But, Mark, thank you very much. Uh, great to have an insight, both on a, on a global basis and, a, and on a micro basis. So thank you very much, and uh, much appreciated for everyone listening. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate thank it. You. Great to be here. Thank you.